Testing one, two, one, two. A, B, C, D. Uh-oh. Testing. This is the range of the camera, so we can move it if you uh, if you'd like to walk around. But uh, or if you'd like to be in the center, you can also. I'll just I'll probably just plan to be here. Is that if that works? Where we need me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I see.
ABC testing one, two, three. You got me. Who's doing the intro? Are you doing the intro? Is anybody? Or I can intro myself. You're Shiva, right? Yep. Thanks for uh, getting us all set up. All right, guys, can you hear me all right in the back? And sounds good. Shivan, thanks for uh, setting this up. Uh, good morning. How you guys doing? Good? All right. I'm excited to see you guys. Um, not only today, I'm here to help uh, just talk about kind of when I was sitting in your seat and uh, kind of how I started a kind of my own hacking, and that turned into uh, an opportunity to give back to Georgia Tech, um, and you guys are sitting in one of the things I've done this, give back to Tech, so I'll be charging you guys rent later for using the building all weekend. But uh, no, but I uh, wanna talk about just the, uh, how I started my uh, first company to turn that into, from an idea, kind of while I was at Georgia Tech into over a billion dollar uh, company, and then uh, kind of that journey, and then just talk about what I'm working on now, and then wanna open up for questions you guys have any questions and stuff so um but high level um i should probably start about how did i get into uh technology i started with video games anybody here play video games pretty much everybody okay good um and one of the things as a kid uh, especially like in middle school high school i kind of got into uh not just playing the video games but i got i wanted to make my own video game anybody else want has anybody made a video game all right, a handful. It's actually pretty hard to make a video game. My first video game kind of sucked. But more importantly, though, uh, I learned how to code and um, be able to program. And that kind of got me into building stuff on the computer. And uh, I guess while in high school, I started learning how to hack. Um, and not just like a hackathon, but more just hacking computers. Uh, Back in the early days of the internet, it was very easy to hack into stuff. And so um, while I was at Georgia Tech, I had actually started to build a program that would, um, has anybody done hacking before? It's kind of, it's kind of boring. It's like you try to connect to different services and 
see what's uh, what's running on a computer. Oh, it's a web server. You know, is it vulnerable to these things? And it takes a lot of time if you're hacking. So I was like, ah, I'll just use my uh, skills that I was using for gaming. Can I code up a program that would automate kind of hacking? Um, and then that way I could go to sleep and let it hack the internet. And uh, basically it was like the first vulnerability scanner. And while I was at Georgia Tech, um, I was in Smith dorm. Anybody uh, familiar with Smith dorm? Handful of people. Um, I released the software for, for free uh, and in my freshman year. And I basically had people, because I, I didn't know what to do with it. I was like, hey, this is actually pretty cool. It's able to find all these vulnerabilities and machines on the uh, Georgia Tech's campus along with around the world. You could point it to anywhere. And basically all these vulnerabilities would uh, get reported. And then I was like, hey, this is useful not only for me, but somebody else might find this useful. And so I released it for free. And with that, uh, I had lots of companies. Well, actually, at that time, this is a 94 time frame. So this give you a sense of how long ago that was. And basically had um, uh, universities reaching out saying, hey, this is, you know, this is great, able to find vulnerabilities. Uh, and I actually had a, uh, somebody called me up and said, have you thought about commercializing this software? And quite honestly, I, I was just doing kind of like a hackathon where I was just doing it for the fun of it. Um, but this guy called me up. He's like, Hey, I'm, I'm, he was in the computer emergency response team, uh, for, for looking at all these threats. And he was like, Hey, you should think about commercializing it. So I was like sitting in my calc class here at Georgia tech. And I was like, man, if I just charge like $1 per vulnerability, this could be a huge company. So, um, I continued to work on it a little bit more and I released basically a commercial version of it. And within like a week or two, uh, I had like an Italian research center call me up and say, Hey, we really like the software. We want to buy it. How much? And I hadn't really figured out pricing, so I just said like a thousand dollars, and said okay. So in my dorm, you know, I'm going to the mailbox. I get my check for a thousand bucks. I'm like, woohoo! You know, this is pretty awesome because I was poor and uh, you know just had enough money to buy beer on the weekends. And so having a thousand bucks was a huge uplift. It allowed me to actually get incorporated. So I was like, okay. Uh, now they, they didn't know I was a student. They just sent me a check and I was like, all right, how do I turn this into a real company? And you have to incorporate and, um, get a business license. And I started setting up a website and all that stuff. So, um, so I continue to, uh, improve upon it. And, uh, you know, what I noticed though, it's kind of like a hackathon is if it, all you did was hackathons and I was starting to hack more on my, on the company idea. The, the challenge I ran into, though, is the more time I spent on my startup, your grades will do the inverse. And so um, I was like, all right, I can either do one, like I liked having decent grades, but I knew that uh, if I continued, I'd either have bad grades or a bad startup. So I was like, I'm going to do one or the other. So I actually took a break. I called my grandmother up. And she lived in Roswell, Georgia, not too far from here. And I was like, hey, I want to set up my... Uh, headquarters at your, uh, she had a condo. And so I was like, can I use a spare guest bedroom? She said, sure. And so I took a break from Georgia Tech and um, I'm still on break from tech. So I could tell you it worked out because there's, you know, my dad was like, what are you doing taking a break from school? And I'm like, well, if the startup doesn't work out, I can always go back. So from a, from a risk perspective, and I looked into it, and I think it's still true. Georgia Tech will give you almost like 10 years before your credits expire. So I was like, all right, I have a long runway then, 10 years before my, my credits expire. Um, that being said, um, I continued. So I took a break, and from there, um, I started looking for uh, customers that uh, – were serious about it. One of my first customers actually was the Department of Energy. There's a, they had a large uh, network at Lawrence Livermore National Labs, 
Actually, I actually went out there during a summer. Uh, they had a summer program, and while I was there, um, I got to use their network as a test bed. I said, hey, I like security. I'm writing this software to find vulnerabilities. Uh, I don't want to go to jail. My dad's a lawyer. He's actually a, a criminal defense attorney, and so I didn't want to use his services ever. So I always try to get permission from uh, whoever I ran the software on. And DOE, they actually agreed to it. They said, hey, if you just give us the reports of what's vulnerable, we'd like to know, you know what the fix. And so they, they, they actually flew me out to Lawrence Livermore National Labs, and uh, they were paying me as a student. Uh, or not, they actually didn't pay me. They just flew me out there. So there was, it wasn't like an internship. It was more this program to uh, learn about supercomputers. And the following year, I'll tell you, um, they actually were about to hire me for the summer. And I remember excited because I was going to get paid to work on my software program. It's one of those things in retrospect turned out um, to be a blessing. They actually had their budget cut and they canceled the entire summer program for summer internship. So I wasn't going to get paid. I was like really upset because I was like, oh, man, I'm, I'm not going to get paid to work on my software. It actually turned out to be the best thing because in retrospect, if they had paid me to work on my software, they would have owned the IP. And how many people can say they use any software from the Department of Energy? Probably nobody. So they would have, it would have been sitting on the shelf. Fortunately, they, because I didn't, I had to continue to work on my own startup idea. And then basically from there, um, they actually reached out later on and said, we want to buy your software. And again, I didn't really have good pricing. Um, but this time I was like, man, maybe I should, because I, I, I figured I was too cheap because, you know, the guy didn't blink when he said a thousand bucks. So I was like, so I, just, I came up with pricing based on how many class B's, class C size networks you have on your network. And basically, um, I remember telling the guy, I was like, how's $50,000, you know, for the software? So I bumped up the price and he was like, all right, at Lawrence Livermore, you're going to have to fly out. You have at 50,000, you have to uh, get my boss to approve that budget. But for 30,000, I have the authority to buy the software right now. And so I said, oh, my software is now 30,000. <laughs> and so um, very quickly, uh, we signed a contract and I sent them the software. And I was like, this is the greatest thing ever because you know, I'd worked at McDonald's and Little Caesars and uh, you know, other places. And to be able to just send some software and get a check back for 30,000. So for the longest time, uh, not only did Lawrence Livermore National Labs uh, purchase for 30 grand, but it, I didn't realize this, but they are all connected to like Oak Ridge National Labs. There's a whole bunch of labs. And each one of them would call me up, how much? 30 grand, boom, here's another check. I was like, all right, this is, this is awesome. So that helped me kind of get going and have confidence in the startup. Uh, and basically, I was like, I had uh, one other friend who's an engineer helping me on the coding side. I was like, I want to find some business people. So I, I had found a, an attorney that could uh, do software agreements. And I'm like, you, I'm looking to hire like salespeople or marketing people. How do I find those people? Um, and he put me in touch with a gentleman, Tom Newman, uh, who had been at Georgia Tech, but he had actually gone to Harvard Business School. So he had some marketing and sales and uh business background and he had been in the business world for for a little while and so he came and and we connected and he could see the vision that i had for protecting the internet and so he joined and on the very first day tom and i uh i had worked out that i was going out to nasa nasa had called me up and said we want you to fly to jpl and show your software that would show how vulnerable they are so when we flew out there um they were asking us to run the software and then we would do a demo for all their leadership uh, and security guys. And so when we ran the demo, uh, I had a good idea that we'd probably find some vulnerabilities, but they were like, this is NASA. We're very secure. You probably won't find anything. But when we ran it, 
all the alarms went off and we had all their passwords and basically control of the entire system behind NASA. So they quickly, some general who ran uh, NASA JPL took us in the back room and were like, we want to buy your software right now. And so Tom and I had to say, hold on, let me huddle in the corner because um, I, I was going to share with him my pricing. And I said, normally I charge 30 grand and he tripled the price. He said like a hundred grand. Uh, so when we came back, we we're like, it's a hundred grand. And they said, we'll buy it. So I was like, high five, you tripled my revenue today. So it was a good start to a great partnership with uh, Tom uh, coming on board. Uh, from there, this is a 95 timeframe Tom joined. We started to say, hey, we really want to grow this because we were starting to see uh, inbound interest, not only in the US, but internationally. And like, some of the people that were reaching from like Russia and Europe and Australia, New Zealand, et cetera. So it was kind of interesting. So I wanted to, we wanted to raise money. Uh, we went out and raised $4 million from venture capital, which was a lot of money back then, especially for an Atlanta based startup. And, uh, you know, Tom, Tom helped us uh, kind of connect with firms out of Boston, out of Silicon Valley, and we ended up raising $4 million. And basically, that helped us uh, set up an office in Europe. So we actually had a ISS, we, Internet Security Systems was the name of my first company, and we set up an ISS headquarters in Europe out of Brussels. And then that covered pretty much what they called EMEA, you know, uh, Europe, Middle East, Africa. And then uh, a year later, we continued to get more and more customers. We used the money, quite frankly, for two main purposes. One was hire a lot of engineers to keep building the solution. And then the other half of the money went towards sales. So sales, support, support marketing. Uh, and then about a year later, we wanted to continue to keep growing, so we raised another $6 million. Uh, and in that scenario, we wanted to continue our, our international focus. So we actually ended up setting up a ISS KK, which is a headquarters in Tokyo. And then, but that from there, that was kind of managing all of Asia. And then the following year, um, as we were just growing, we ended up taking the company public on the NASDAQ. Um, funny thing is, is I did not know anything about the stock market, so I'd always seen on TV the ringing of the bell and people sh screaming in the pits and stuff. So I was expecting that, not realizing NASDAQ is all computerized. So I go up to uh, New York and Goldman Sachs, which is a, one of the large banks up there, was like, hey, we're taking you public. And uh, the day we were going public, I remember you have your talk, um, ticker symbol ISSX was our ticker symbol. And so I'm like, all right, when does it start trading? And it was about like 11 a.m. Uh, that business day when it, when it was about the trade. And the minute it started trading, our ticker was starting to go across. But then the ticker blinked and crashed on the sign. And I was like, oh, man, some hacker did not like us going public for some reason. So um, the good news, though, it turned out it was some overflow issue with the sign and not the stock market. So good news is we did not bring down the stock market. <laughs> uh, just high level, you know, from an engineering perspective, started with the vulnerability scanning, looking for weaknesses across the network. Uh, we ended up hiring uh, a lot of amazing security researchers that would find vulnerabilities, overflows, all kinds of stuff that would get you into any kind of network, whether it was firewalls, we found basically vulnerabilities in all the layers that you can imagine of a network. And then uh, we started then building monitoring systems, like a burglar alarm, so we could see if someone was breaking in. And we started uh, actually doing managed security services. So we actually, uh, up close to Roswell and 285, we have a, a, there's an IBM building on 400. You may see it if you ever drive up 400 on, on the left-hand side. Inside that building is a, with a SOC, a security operations center, where you have to put your handprint down and go inside, and they're monitoring the networks. And so we were able to monitor lots of networks. We continued to grow that, and uh, 
after doing it for over like 10, 15 years, I ended up uh, saying, hey, this is, you know, it's scaled. Uh, one of our major partners came along and said, we really love what you're doing. Uh, we would like to acquire you. And uh, IBM ended up spending about $2 billion, uh, you know, a little bit over a billion for the U.S. entity and another like seven, eight hundred million for the ISS KK entity. So the total of it, they spent a lot of money and uh, acquired ISS. At the time, I wanted to get back into uh, stuff that I like doing, um, which was gaming. And so I actually started building a platform for virtual world. I still have a virtual world for casinos. If anybody likes playing poker, it's more specifically poker. Uh, and within that, I test out lots of um, algorithms on the poker game and the meta game and gamification and seeing what works. We do a lot of A-B tests and all that. A lot of marketing is tied in with it. It's not gambling because it's not – you can buy the chips, but the chips you can't redeem. So no one's, no one's putting money in thinking they're going to get money out. It's purely fun. So with that, though uh, – in parallel to that, I've been working on kind of this idea of how do we take what I did, which was start a company out of Georgia Tech and turn that into a success. Up until about five or six years ago, um, when, especially when I was here, when I told my friends, I'm like, hey, I'm going to take a break from Georgia Tech and do a startup. They all looked at me weird. Um, like, man, what, why would you do that? That's retarded. Um, or Probably not the right word nowadays, but that's not smart, I guess. Uh, and ultimately, they ended up, um, you know, just like, that's crazy that you're doing it. So ult ultimately, um, I, but I was like, man, I've come to think like a hackathon, right? Hack GT, uh, I was, the very first one happened to be in the Klaus building. Uh, so it's a repeat. So it's nice to see it's back in the Klaus building. And, uh, uh, but all these ideas that were happening, I'm like, why isn't there more startups at Georgia Tech? I actually ended up building a couple of accelerators, you know, taking ideas. How do we scale it? Um, and so I've been, uh, so I helped fund and start the first CreateX program here. And to me, the, the huge advantage that an accelerator does isn't so much that, like, Yes, it's nice. Like when I did it, I had to Google. I don't even think there was Google back then uh, when I did it. But it was like you had to ask a lot of people, like, how do I get incorporated? How do I do this? How do I do that? It's much easier if you have a cohort of peers that are also all doing the same thing. It's kind of like working out. You can work out by yourself, but it's a lot better if you have a coach, you have a team, you're all working together to kind of be competitive, you're going to just move faster. So I think I think I see that true with um, the accelerators. Also, it, it was the catalyst to change the culture at Georgia Tech, where Georgia Tech, up until about five or six years ago, everyone came here to go become an engineer and then go get a job um, out in the industry. And I was like, you know, why not help you guys create jobs um, and create startups? And so... Um, proud to see CreateX has scaled. One of my theses is I looked at a lot of data. I don't know. You guys all familiar with YC? Anybody not know what YC is? All right, good. You all, I assume you all know what it is. Then if you look at YC, they released like how many unicorns they've had, how many startups. And the ratio that I saw early on, and it gets better, uh, is that they had almost like 250 to 300 startups to one unicorn. Uh, and, and so be, as I got started, I was like, hey, we really should try to build a program that scales to 300 startups a year so we can get at least one unicorn every year being hatched or, or baked. And so what's interesting, though, is this year, uh, CreateX had almost 100 startups. But if you add up all the startups that have been through CreateX, it was actually 310 startups have gone through CreateX. And then as, at the end of this year, or at the end of this uh, batch this summer, we actually had our, had our first unicorn. Um, so that, that was pretty cool that it worked out, you know, that uh, here's 300 startups, you get one unicorn. But I think the, the pattern that I see will be the next five years 
for CreateX, if you guys want to get into startups, is that that ratio actually decreases, meaning it goes from like 250 to like 200 to 150 to 100. So like, you know, I don't think you'll ever get one to one, but you'll definitely, and I think what happens is, is that the, over time, all these startups help de-risk the next generation of startups. So one of the things I'm doing is trying to connect in all the verticals, uh, the startups that are doing, like there's uh, startups that are doing CPG or consumer packaged goods. And there's a lot of challenges with how do you manufacture, how do you get distribution? But if you're doing it the first time, it's really hard. Who do I talk to? What are the connections? What do you recommend? But if somebody's two or three years ahead of you, you can leverage that. And that's one of the things I'm trying to do is build a platform now to automate connecting all the stuff together on an ongoing basis. So long term, I'm, I'm very excited about kind of the innovation scaling up as you guys identify interesting problems to work on. One of the things I'm looking at trying to help is how do we keep scaling both, you know, you guys getting into a uh, into an accelerator, but ultimately, you know, provide funding, mentors, other peer startups, uh, talent, talent, you know, how do you find the right people? So anyways, that's the problem that I've been working on lately. So, um, but with that, I wanted to open up for questions. Yeah, there's a there's probably not one contributing thing that I could say that's what drove the success. I think timing was good. Um, internet was just starting to take off. Literally, there was very few security companies uh, at the time. Um, but I would still argue that even today, the market's only gotten bigger, as you guys know. So it's you know there's there's no like Google that owns security, right? And so. It's a great market. Um, so I think the, the fact that it was a big problem, big market, um, timing was right. You do have your ups and downs with any, any startup. So for me, one of the things I do do, um, go encourage is meditation, uh, just to kind of balance out because you're going to get stressed out and uh, it doesn't matter. It, from the outside, every startup looks like it's, you know, probably doing great and Inside, there's always like, oh, man, there's always fires you're putting out. So um, I don't know if there's I, – I would say um, big problem, you know, uh, find great people. That was the other big – big uh, probably one of the biggest contributors is getting the right people on board. Like Tom Manunin, he was uh, very great at helping create culture for the startup. You know, like early on, you want to be like – what kind of startup do we want to build? And we, we really focused on, I guess, um, work hard, play hard. So we ended up, you know, having lots of parties every Friday and uh, lots of uh, helping our team out if they got in trouble because they might have partied too hard. But ultimately, we ended up uh, also working hard. So we had a lot of great people and trying to early on find great people, I think, is, is one of the biggest uh, areas that drives to success. Um, so I do want to uh, just button here real quick. We actually have a live stream going as well. So okay. People have been given Google Form to submit questions. So oh, perfect. Um, and we will also ask people to answer questions. Do you mind repeating the question so that people in the live stream Oh, sure. Answer? Yep. Okay. So um, yeah, since we're doing room questions, we can go ahead and take more. I saw a hand over there. Yeah. Um, so how did you get the like initial were you like marketing your software or was it all like word of mouth between people? Yeah. Questions How do I get my first set of uh, customers or users of my product? I uh, probably the to get the users actually by releasing it for free. Uh, and then at that time, there wasn't any like advertising networks, but there was a lot of mailing lists, you know, almost like pre. 
uh, Reddit and some of these communities. So I, I probably would recommend for any startup kind of take that, can take that similar approach and find a community that you think would be uh, interested in your solution. And so I've posted on every security mailing list and forum I could find on the internet and was like, hey, and you know, sometimes I'd be posting like, hey, does anybody know a great scanner? And then I'd probably do a second post from another a friend that would then say, oh, here, have you heard of this product? You know, check it out. <laughs> so basically, whatever to get the word out, and pretty soon they were downloading it for free. And then what I found is uh, my earliest customers were already users of the product. So when I announced the commercial version, they were inside these large companies that were like, Yes, we want the support. We want to have updates. We want to know that it's actually a real product and not just open source or free software. So I think that was a big, that was my first set of customers was the fact that it was free. I took some low cost guerrilla marketing, so to speak. Uh, and you, you'll you find like um, that's huge. And ultimately, most of those people I ended up calling and talking with and be like, hey, what's, what, what's your, you know, why are you buying this? What features are valuable? So I got a lot of great feedback from those early customers to make it a great product. If that makes sense. Any other questions? Any questions online? Yeah. Um, so we have a couple. One of them is, did you ever experience moments of doubt in your startup career? How did you mentally persevere when the startup route, when the startup route is traditionally riskier than corporate work? Yeah, it's a good question. So. Um, there's definitely a lot of doubt. There was quite a few times. Um, interestingly, while I was at Georgia Tech, there was a couple other cybersecurity companies here in town. And um, what's interesting is before I announced a commercial version, I had like had lunch with one of the cybersecurity companies, and they were like, "Hey, um, you know, we love what you're doing. What's your interest? You know, what do you plan to do?" With and I had just given it away for free. And then what's interesting is uh, probably I announced that commercial version and very quickly I had that Italian research center sending me $1,000. But they, they showed up and said, hey, we want to buy your software for $20,000. And I swear if they had probably asked me a week earlier, 20 grand, and I hadn't thought about a commercial version, I probably would have been like, oh my God, as a student, 20 grand, that's a no-brainer, right, to take. But fortunately, I had announced a commercial version, and getting that first $1,000 check, I was like, oh, well, let me see how this, let me see where this takes me. Um, and then I also uh, very quickly, um, what was interesting, almost every year, somebody would try to acquire uh, my company, and I want to say like six months later, um, there was another company that was like here in town just saying, hey, we want to buy your company for a thousand or a hundred thousand dollars and I was like oh that's that'd be great you know maybe six months ago but I just you know had Department of Energy in total spend at least a hundred grand with me already why would I sell for what I just generated on my own and I'm a one-man company so I ended up um, kind of continue on there but there's definitely periods where you're ending up going ah oh, this is um, this isn't working or you know, I want to, I want to just sell. Um, but ultimately I think if you get the right people with you, um, I was, especially with once I got Tom Noonan and we were raising money, it became a lot, probably a little easier just because the problem was every year we kept scaling it. So if you find a big problem and you're seeing that it's growing, it's, uh, probably most of the issues we ran into were, uh, things you'll find when, if you grow a startup, which is, you might not hire the right people for the right role. And then that that's usually where you have the some of the biggest conflicts is like, oh man, this is not going the way we wanted it to. And you gotta figure out what to do with that person and and you know, do you transition them out? Do you find a different position? That was probably one of the biggest challenges is just hiring not always hiring the right people and being quick to try and figure out is this the right structure there. Um, actually there's a uh relevant question to this topic. So how do you succeed as an employee at a startup? What are some impactful things to be proactive about to make yourself a more valuable employee? Within a startup? Yes, within a startup. Yeah, I, it's, it's 
I mean, I think there's like two, two or three reasons you'd want to, if you're not co-founding the startup, which I think is, um, you know, unique opportunity. But even if you join early on, depending on the size of the startup, I think there's, it's very different to join a startup when there's only like two or three people. Once you get to uh, 10 people, it's still a startup, but it's like now there's the, the wearing of many hats. So it really comes down to like, when do you join? If it's real early, the, the benefit is twofold. I would try to make sure you get equity. Like, hey, am I getting ownership? Because otherwise you can go work for a large company and not you get like a sliver of equity. But early on, I would highly recommend saying, hey, I want to be part of the co-founding team and get some equity so that you have upside if it turns into a you know, large company. Uh, and then the other thing is you get to wear many hats. So early on, I think that's probably the biggest thing I felt that I got out of doing my own startup was, wow, I had to learn marketing. I had to learn sales. I had to learn engineering. I had to learn product management. I had to learn customer support. Um, I had to learn how to travel and do speeches. And so you end up wearing all these different hats. Um, and then you find out what you like to do. Like, what do you like to do? And then you can kind of migrate towards that area. So I think that's the biggest reason you would join a startup. And uh, in terms of how do you be valuable, I just probably just say, hey, what are the, how can I contribute? What are the biggest problems you can help tackle for that startup? Any other questions there? So, um, so yeah, you told your whole story about how uh, you started from a one-man startup, and uh, now you do a lot of like um, investing in new startups, uh, like especially at the in Atlanta. And so, like these days, when we're talking about like um, starting a startup and getting funding from like a VC, it's always pushing the idea that um, you can't just have like a good product, but you also need to have like. Uh, relatively solidified business model to go with it. But clearly when you were um, starting up, you didn't really um, like worry too much about like the business model aspect and kind of just went with it. Um, but um, so with your unique perspective, how would you uh, say like new startups these days should prioritize like pushing the, like when you're a young startup, like the idea of having just a really cool product and running with it or like actually having to create a business model and look for how you can sell your product. Like what is, what's the balance there? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, I guess as CEO of your own startup, you'll probably get a sense of when's the right time to add monetization. And for me, it was pretty much very quickly when I commercialized, because I was like, all right, the whole point of me announcing a commercial version was so I could sell it. And then I could then go, okay, now I can go start to hire people. And that was really the motivation was, hey, I'm going to start growing this into a company. So very quickly, sales and marketing and putting a price tag on the product probably happened. Um, reason I gave it away free was I actually still like the freemium model. Like my poker game is free. Um, CreateX is, is free, et cetera. Anything I build, I usually try to give it away for free with an upsell. And so if you can build that into the model, um, I'd say my virtual world, that was a, probably a, one of the lessons I learned for myself is I did not charge early enough, um, meaning I ended up going, I'm going to optimize on creativity. So we had like tens of thousands of designers uploading all kinds of 3D models and textures and all that, and um, I didn't commercialize it fast enough. And I think if I were to go back, I would have said, hey, my North Star is more revenue um, as opposed to just coming in and having fun and so on. And so I think long term, I think gaming is obviously moved in that direction where almost all the top grossing games, they're free. But then very quickly, as you know, they pop up and go, hey, wouldn't you like to buy some uh, gems or something? So it's a good, good question. I think you have to just make a decision. How long do you want to have it for free? I think VCs and others are going to unless it's a viral product, they're gonna to wanna to see some kind of traction for your business. Yeah, so um, let's say you uh, are 20 again, right? Yep. Uh, and you were in the middle of your Georgia Tech college degree. What kind of things would you, um, what do you think you would do now with the experience of 
finish your degree? Um, what, what, what do you think? That's a good question. You know, um, it's always context to what decision you're trying to decide, right? If you're not, if you don't have a problem that you're working on, then you might as well finish your degree. I encourage my kids. I have uh, two boys that are now uh, applying for college, et cetera. And so I'm encouraging them, hey, go get your degree. But if you find uh, you start working on a problem, you think it has potential to be a startup or a nonprofit or something. Um, I, in, in fact, my uh, oldest son, I, he took a gap year. I was like, hey, mentally, he needed some time to think and um, uh, mature a little bit. So I was like, hey, do a gap year. So I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. You know, life is, you've got a long time to live it. And so, you know, take, take your time, take a gap year if you want to work on a startup. Um, obviously, I, I'm a fan of finishing degrees, uh, even though I haven't yet. But uh, I think, uh, I definitely think going back, it really depends on what kind of, where you are with your life to say, I don't, it'd be hard for me just because I think once you get bitten by the bug of entrepreneurship, almost every founder that has gone through CreateX has done a startup. I can't think of any that said, oh man, I can't wait to go into huge corporate America. They're all, they've all stayed in startup land. Like they're all building their next startup. And even the one, so they've had the ones that have success, the only ones that probably beyond that summer, uh, if they didn't continue on, they might've been like, Hey, I want to get my master's degree or finish out my academic career. So they, they didn't really bite into their startup, but almost all of them that have like went full time on their startup, typically they'll, they'll stay in startup land and, and maybe go online. The nice thing is more and more, uh, education is becoming an online option. So I know a lot of our now coming from the online masters in computer science. And so that's, Pretty exciting because, as you guys probably know, there's like thousands of um, masters in computer science, and they're all over the country. And so they're actually uh, starting to do more. And one of the nice things I, I think is that all these accelerators um, will stay virtual. Um, like CreateX used to be you had to come to Atlanta, or you didn't have to, but it was very much physically first. And the, the downside of that is where do you find space? You know, when you start getting huge teams or a huge number of teams, uh, the other issue is it's not very efficient uh, versus, you know, week over week, you can dial into a lecture remotely, you know, talk to your coaches and then boom, you're back to focusing on your on your customers or building your product or whatever it is. So I actually think accelerators will stay virtual like CreateX. The only thing we'll probably end up doing with it is um, make it virtual first and then overlay social events because people still want that face-to-face -face handshake, you know, grab a beer, um, get some real time with people. But I, I do think, I think YC, I think CreateX, all of them are going to go in that path. And I'm working on like a platform to help CreateX to stay more online and more possibly a MOOC style of take some of the lectures wherever, but also connect with the teams virtually, kind of gamify it. Because I, I believe games are are more fun. Uh, you mentioned how you have some projects uh, that you're working on, and uh, all these ideas and accelerating innovation. However, how do you find time to kind of balance out your personal life and and balance out the work life? Like, how, how do you balance that out? Yeah, it's a good question. So the question is, if you have a lot of different projects going on, how do you balance both your personal life? and some of the projects and the startups? That's a good question. Um, I guess early on in my 20s when I was doing the startup, um, I would say I was pretty much 100% focused on the startup. You know, I'd be sleeping bag and all that stuff. I think as you get older, you're like, okay, I'm going to not spend as much time because I don't need to uh, spend the, the, the nights there uh, doing that. I think, um, but early on, if you're really passionate about your idea, you're going to just prioritize what you're passionate about, you know, and then, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't get married too early, I would say would be, or don't buy a big house, you know, all the stuff that causes you later on, it becomes harder to do a startup for those reasons. Like you got kids, you got a house. Most of the people I talk to, they might be like, Oh, I've got a great startup idea, but how do I do that and pay the bills versus at this age, 
you're happy to have a couch, you know, and you can build a startup anywhere, right? So I think that's the balance that you have to find. Obviously, you had to set some aside to pay your own bills. How much of that did you put back into the company versus keep for yourself? Yeah, so good question. Like, how as you're doing your startup, how do you balance, I guess, your income level versus wealth? To be honest, when you have a startup, you actually are only wealthy on paper. And so uh, it's not until you either go public that you actually are able to sell your shares. Um, I did sell a little bit of shares before we went public. So when we raised a round, you can negotiate with the VCs to go, hey, I've got this amount of shares. I'd like to sell some personally. And like I sold a hundred grand just to kind of pay for a car, um, pay off my, all my student debt, everything. And so in that scenario, I think early on, I didn't pay myself anything. It was like basically the least amount I could pay myself, um, but enough to cover gas money, food, you know, I wasn't really taking a salary just because I didn't need it. Um, I was still living at my grandmother's place. She wasn't charging me rent at the time, so that was good. Um, but later on, once you raise enough money, you end up, normally the pattern is you just, what would, whatever role you end up taking, like I was a CTO or I was CEO, I was like, hey, for a startup at this stage, what's a good salary? But you're always balancing it with like, hey, most of your value is in the equity. And the more money you take out of the company, you're kind of taking on less, you're just, you're lowering your chance of success. I was like, all right, well, I'm just going to bet all of it on my company. And so I left it all in equity. And then later on, once it went public, then I just set up a program to sell regularly. And that's just recommended. That's the thing they were recommending for me was just figure out how much you want to sell every quarter. And the reason they do that nowadays, or they were recommending it then, was you just didn't want to get sued for insider trading. So if it's a known pattern where every quarter after the earnings are announced, here's how much sells. If that stays a consistent pattern, then it's hard to say that I was trading on insider information. So um, those were kind of the, the evolution. You know, Early on, don't pay me anything. It's all equity. Later on, I, as I was raising money, maybe it sold enough to kind of help pay down some of my debt and and then later on take a salary that's commiserate with what the market was would you would expect and you normally negotiate with whoever your um your board is to say hey what's a fair compensation for whatever role you end up taking whether it's cto or ceo type thing Um, so I'll answer this second question. Uh, when did I switch from consumer to, I guess, enterprise or business? Um, it was always enterprise, actually. Um, we did, we in, meaning early on, even though I gave it away for free, everybody that was downloading it was like the security team with inside of organizations. So very early, the only people who... I mean, think about it. Who who thinks about vulnerabilities? It's not your consumer, right? Consumers don't care about. I mean, they they want their don't want viruses and so on, but they're not looking to scan their network, looking for vulnerabilities. It's only uh, really the the either the security team or the network team or IT or ops we ended up selling into. So it was always enterprise. So there was later on we did provide a. We bought a product called Black Ice, which was like a personal firewall, but they it was it was kind of a hybrid of we could sell it to consumers, but we actually were not really good at selling into consumers because we'd never built out that distribution. So we ended up still using it within a large company. We want to protect your laptops and you know your workforces are working remotely. So it, it could have gone consumer, but we really never focused on that. And what was your first question? Yeah, so the questions, if I could go back in time, what would I change? Uh, and there was, there was probably, um, you know, if I knew what I knew now, what would I do differently? I think there's a lot of change. Probably there's a lot of optimizations I would do faster. Like 
obviously now, one of the things I've studied a lot, especially on the gaming side, is UX and UI. Back then, it was like, if someone couldn't figure out your products, you're just like, oh, give them training and they'll, they'll figure it out. But nowadays, user design is so critical for people to onboard and become users of your products. So I would have done that sooner. I probably would say, um, I think ISS probably going back could have been a bigger company just because we sold so early, meaning uh, we were just on the beginning of managed security services. And obviously, SaaS has taken off to be, you know, uh, that was a billion dollar company like 10, over 10 years ago, probably be worth much more if we had kept it separately. Um, so probably hold on to it more. Don't don't sell. Don't give up as much equity. You know, uh, would be another thing. So, good question there. Uh, what's your opinion on uh, bootstrapping versus taking VC funds? It's a great question. Uh, so the question is, should I bootstrap or should I take on funding from VC? Um, it's really uh, if you feel. I guess I th both ways are. Uh, Good paths. So there's probably not a right answer. It really depends on your both what you want to achieve out of it. The pros and cons, I guess I can lay out for you. Like bootstrapping, you can own 100% of your startup. Uh, the reason I didn't boot, I was kind of bootstrapping, but the reason I found the VC route is my logic was I'd rather own, you know, a, a bigger slice of a watermelon than to own 100% of a pea, I guess, you know, kind of just from a sizing perspective, tying into the whole marketplace theme that we have here. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, the reason you raise money is we were able to then ramp faster than any of our competitors. Like I knew there was a bunch of competitors and nobody really copies you when it's just you and like two other people with your idea. It's when you start other people go, wow, these, this company is really succeeding then you start seeing everybody really copy you. So I don't worry about IP protection early on uh, for the first year. But ultimately, um, once you're scaling, the question is, is can you scale faster? And if you're raising a lot of money, then you can hire more sales, more engineers, and get the momentum going. So that's the trade-off is that um, raising money from venture capital. That's one piece of it on the money side, but also... Um, it was great to have a board and expertise. You, whoever you're going to raise money from, I'd highly encourage you to not look at it as a pure money thing. It's more about, hey, what value can they contribute? And a lot of the venture funds out there hopefully will do a lot of stuff to, to help guide you towards what, what do you need to do to scale your business. And that, that's something that I think is extremely valuable that if you're just bootstrapping, you might solve it yourself. Lots of companies have done it. MailChimp, I think, is one. Um, but there's a lot of other companies that are raising money, scaling faster. So. I think um, that is all we have time for today. Okay. Of course, you can come up and ask questions after. We do have people watching on the live stream. Oh, sure. Do you want to wrap it up? But thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. For Good luck on it, your hack, hacking. Look forward to seeing what you build tomorrow. Cool. Thanks, guys. No, no, no.